Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Brie Noble. I am excited to be here with Emily White. She uh, is the founder of Collective Entertainment. She's also a best-selling author of a book that I know you guys are going to be excited to hear about because it's all about income streams and making sure that you collect all of your money, which you guys know I am all about. Um, She's also founded something called Get Out the Vote Festival, which I'm interested to find out more about. So let's get started. But first of all, Emily, I would just love to know a little bit about your background. Um, What is your musical background? How did you get involved in the music industry? Uh, Just a little bit about your journey up to here. Sure. I'll try to explain that as short as possible. Um, I am classically trained in piano and know my guitar chords, but I'm not talented at all. So um, (laughs) I was always very interested uh, interested in the industry and, and the business side. Um, So I went to Northeastern University uh, and studied in their music business program and did a lot of internships. Um, My first book is actually called Interning 101. And my first internship was at Powderfinger Promotions, which I got through the school. They do college radio promo and PR. Um, After that, I interned at WBCN in Boston, rest in peace, amazing um, legendary radio station. Um, I worked at an indie label um, outside of Boston called Q Division. Um, After that, I worked at what's now Live Nation Artists and also worked at a few clubs, um, Northeastern's in Boston. So um, that's why all this stuff was there. Um, That following summer, I went to New York and interned at VH1 Classic. Um, That fall, I went, or I I came back to Boston and met a band called the Dresden Dolls, um, started working with them when I was about 20. Um, And we really grew up professionally together. I became their tour manager, their day-to-day manager, their manager. Um, In between all of that, I also did an internship uh, in London at um, MTV and VH1, um, but then came back and didn't walk in my graduation ceremony because the Dresden Dolls, I mean, I did graduate, but didn't walk because um, the Dresden Dolls were starting a three continent tour with Nine Inch Nails and Um, The day I was supposed to walk, we were at Coachella. Mm, Um, Good reason. Yeah, thanks. Um, By then, the Dresden Dolls took on management, and I'm forever grateful they went with a guy named Mike Luba. Um, Luba hired me to work at his company, Madison House, which had a New York office at the time. So I tour managed the band and and went all over the world. But then when I wasn't on the road, I would um, I would be working in the office doing day to day management for the band. Um, did that until I retired from tour management at 23, um, <laughs> and then I started working uh, full time at, at Madison House, and that's really where I got um, my management chops and and worked with a lot of great artists. Um, around that time, I wrote a name your own price uh, business plan for um, Amanda Palmer, is the singer of the Dresden Dolls, and I'd seen. Um, a fan come up to her and and this was like 2007. Um, I'd seen, I saw a fan come up to her to show and give her a check for a few hundred dollars and say, I just want to support you and your art. And she had her first solo album coming out and I knew the label would never let us do this, but I was like, why can't we just put it up as like a zip file and have it be a suggested donation? Um, kind of like how museums operate. And I presented that to my two bosses at the time. Um, Luba was like, this is amazing. Like, let's get on a call. And the other boss is like, this will never work. Like, go back to working on your artists. 
Um, I, I was kind of working on it in my spare time um, when Radioheads in Rainbows came out with the exact same concept. <laughs> and my naysaying boss, um, his favorite band is Radiohead. So when I came into That's the office funny. the next day, yeah, he was like, Radiohead stole your idea. So that was kind of his acknowledgement of like, okay, maybe I should pay attention to this. But I mentioned that because Luba was going to work at Live Nation Artists in 2008, um, which was a half a billion dollar division of Live Nation where the first signees were Madonna, U2, and Jay-Z. And Luba passed along my business plan to Bob Ezrin, who produced Pink Floyd's The Wall, amongst many other things. And Bob was heading up the recording division for Live Nation Artists. So I picked up and moved to Miami, which is where this was based. And going into it, I was like, this is either going to be the biggest thing ever or a big disaster. But if it's a disaster, it'll be a great learning experience. Um, Because I was 24, so I kind of treated it like grad school. And um, I worked on the Zac Brown band down there. Um, I didn't know anything about country music. Oh, gosh, I'm a huge Zac Brown band fan. (laughs) Nice. Um, So, like, you know, my bosses said to me, like, you know, well, you know how to use the Internet, so we're going to give, you know, Zac to you. And I was like, okay, what are his ticket counts in Nashville? And the answer was 40, (laughs) 40. So I was like, okay, we have some work to do. Um, So we were all working really hard um, when there were rumors in the Wall Street Journal that um, Michael Cole, who's the Rolling Stones longtime promoter and who was running our division, um, wasn't getting along with Michael Rapino. And uh, we were all laid off one day, um, seven months into being there. Um, So I started my first management firm um, immediately after that. Uh, It was called White Smith Entertainment. And we Um, managed musicians and comedians. And then I expanded into sports in the 2012 because I come from uh, a family of coaches and I was on an athletic scholarship in college. Um, So we did that for a decade until my longtime business partner left management. And I partnered with a few protégés to launch Collective Entertainment, um, saying on one hand, I want this to be whatever you want. Um, on the other, I'm just moving our music and sports divisions uh, over. So that was in like 2018, um, which is also around the time we, la- we launched Hashtag I Voted Festival. Um, we started by activating um, over 150 concert venues in 37 states uh, to let fans in for the 2018 midterm elections who showed a selfie um, from outside their polling place on election night. Um, so we had some really amazing artists participate that first year. Um, Playboy Cardi, Jim James in My Morning Jacket, Maggie Rogers. Um, And then we were planning um, a big 2020. I was holding arenas in in swing states uh, when the pandemic hit. So we pivoted and produced the largest digital concert in history. Um, Over 450 artists participated and fans accessed our election night stream uh, with a selfie at home with their blank and unmarked ballot. And we were really fortunate to have, you know, Billie Eilish and Living Color and um, Trey Anastasio. And, and we booked all that talent per the, da- per the data, <coughs> excuse me, um, of what fans were listening to in swing states whose elections are often decided by the size of a concert venue. Um, so that's my background and <laughs> the shortest time I can give it. Wow. I mean, you, you've done a lot. That is, that is amazing. So Let's see if I can go back to kind of the early part here. I wanted to ask about the internships because I know you've written a book about this. Um, You did a lot of them. Um, Just curious, like, did you do a lot of them in order to figure out, like, what is the thing that I really love to do Um, or just to, like, get a lot of things on your resume? The the first one, Um, I was ride or die music, um, but I didn't know what I wanted to do in the field. So I was just like on this quest Um, to figure it out, but it ended up also being the second option where, you know, in hindsight, that was um, great. I'm not doing much artist management anymore, but um, that ended up being a great background to become an artist manager because I could really empathize with what it's like on the other, you know, end of the phone or the inbox. And even with I Voted Festival, like, you know, all my years as a tour manager um, allows me to deeply understand the economics uh, behind the concert industry, which has allowed me to apply that to voter turnout. So I never would have, you know, thought of that in my early twenties, but it's amazing how these things can all come together later in life. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I like that advice, especially for people 
who are looking, like you said, to get into the music industry. They want to do music. They didn't know which part of the industry. Do they want to be in live shows? Do they want to be in management? Do they want to be in your recording? All that stuff, right? Um, how, well, actually, what I really want to ask is, do you suggest musicians do that kind of thing as well? Or is this more for just people who are looking to work in the industry, but they're not a musician? I think it depends on their track and what they're interested in. Like I said, like I'm not a talented musician at all. So I was totally on an industry track. If someone is building their career as a musician, I would say they should focus on that and put themselves out there as far as like, you know, attending, you know, pandemic or not, right? Like attending conferences, attending, you know, Zoom seminars, um, getting out to shows, especially in your community, starting to get to know other artists. Um, but there's obviously plenty of successful industry people that are really talented musicians as well. So if that's something you might be interested in, um, you know, there's a lot of great uh, musicians that I feel like work at publishing companies, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's a certain part of the industry um, that interests you, you, you might want to try that because it's something, you know, you might be interested in later in life as well. I think it just depends on what your, what your interests are. And, and I think people should really listen to their intuition on that. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. And I think you can like really learn a lot about the thing that you want to do. So let's say, for example, you want to learn about the music licensing industry because you want to get licensed. You can absolutely do that by working as an intern for a company that's licensing a lot of music. Now I do have a friend that did that and it is like grueling. It can be grueling work. Cause if you're working as an intern, you're just like processing contracts and stuff like that, but you can learn a ton. Definitely. And also like, if you think whether you're a musician or not, and you think licensing is awesome and you get to your licensing internship and your processing contracts and you think that sucks, um, it's just as important at internships or volunteering or whatever to figure out what you don't want to do and what turns you off as much as what you're interested in doing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So let's talk about, um, and I love all your, your experience with management, Amanda Palmer. I mean, that's all amazing. And Zach Brown band. I didn't even know about that. Um, I can imagine in 2007, you know, 40, 40 tickets in Nashville, I think two years later, they were probably blowing up. Right. Yeah. That was a really wild experience. Cause again, um, at live nation artists, like at this point, I feel like I could talk about this stuff publicly. Like they were trying to sign every artist in the world. Mm. Uh, and like I said, the first ones were Madonna, U2, Jay-Z. Those were very large, 150 million historic deals. And they signed Zach for only 1 million mm. and said, okay, well, Emily knows how to develop artists and use the internet. So let's give this project to her. And like I said, like, I didn't know anything about country music, but um, I could see, I hadn't seen him play live in person yet, but I saw some live clips on YouTube and I was like, this guy can really play. And there's college kids at the shows, you know, and um, again, this is 2008. So I wish I could remember the name of this social network, but there was actually a social network for country music mm -hmm. uh, that we really focused in on. And I know my bosses really wanted to incorporate, you know, brands into the strategy, but it was full on. I mean, they were spending a lot of money at country radio. Um, there were massive weekly calls, you know, with just like, I mean, I swear like five people from the booking agency on it. So um, yeah, and then I'm pretty sure, I'm saying this really like off the record and kind of off the cuff, but when Live Nation artists fell apart, I'm pretty sure Zach was able to keep his million dollars and then go do a new deal with Atlantic. So it definitely mm -hmm. worked out for him. And as you know, he like sells at stadiums, but I will say, at, you know, sells at stadiums at this point, I will say, um, you know, he, he really did everything right. I mean, first and foremost, the music's great. And like, like I said, it's a killer live show, but like, you know, even at the time, like, okay. So in Miami, I'm sure this has changed, but I really didn't like the food other than Cuban food. I mean, I live in New York now, like food is one of the reasons I live here and Zach cooked for us. Like he barbecued for our team and it was like the best meal I had in Miami. And so he would do eat and greets instead of meet and greets. And he has a whole line of like Zach Brown barbecue sauces. And so <laughs> he was developing a lot of that stuff really early. And I think he does a really great job connecting with his fans, even though he's playing stadiums. I love that. And, and I think that is really what makes artists successful, whether they have this big backing or not, right. Is that they are really meeting fans 
on like a really personalized level like that. I am curious though, like, do you think, let's say that he was just a total indie artist and he didn't have that million dollar backing from Live Nation and they weren't going out doing all this stuff, you know, to country radio and all that. Do you think he would have eventually made it? Like, do you really believe that artists like him that are super talented can make it outside of the industry kind of? I definitely do. And I think he would have had um, a really strong live fan, like strong and loyal live fan base, no matter what, because again, I think I can, this is so long ago. I think I can talk about this stuff, but like, you know, I was told like, think of Dave Matthews band. That's how we're positioning Zach Brown band. And like, that's always how I've operated is just like, okay, if I love this music, that means someone else is probably going to love it. Like I'm not really focused on like hit songs as weird as that might sound. I'm much more interested in building um, fan bases for the long term. So I think he would have been able to do that, but you cannot take anything away from, you know, the five figures a month that was being spent at country radio. I mean, it's almost impossible to get paid, get played on, major radio, let let alone country radio without an equally major budget. So I think that was like, like maybe he wouldn't be playing stadiums, but I do think he would have a viable, um, you know, maybe like a theater level career, which I actually think is kind of ideal, you know, then it's like, you kind of have your life, but you're making good money and you can do it forever. I do too. I mean, I've been to a Zach Brown band concert and it is, it's, it's just not doing the music as much justice as I would like, because the stadium is too, the, you know, it was an indoor venue, but it was just, it's too big. You know, it's hard to like have the amplification in a way that really makes the music sound as good as it can. Absolutely. But like I said, I still think it's cool. And I, I don't know if he's still doing this, but it's like, you know, for people that can afford it, like how rad is an eat and greet with one of your yeah. favorites? <laughs> I love that. I love that. So is this kind of why you ended up writing the book to help musicians to, to make money and keep all of their income streams because you saw that like the way that the world was moving, right? I mean, Zach Brown band 2008, 2009 is a very different world from now, as far as what you can do as an indie artist, even outside of like most people are building their careers totally outside of radio nowadays. For sure. So I wrote it for two reasons. One musicians kept wanting to get coffee with me to pick my Mm. brain. And I was having the same conversation over and over. So I was like, why don't I just write this down for everyone? And then hopefully it can help more people. Um, And then also pretty much every time we took on an artist at collective entertainment, we were finding money for them. And Uh, so I'm like, like, okay, if this is happening to national acts that people have heard of, then what about everyone else? So yeah, it's a really straightforward guide. Um, It takes artists through the modern music industry from recording to release or creation. Um, I might have said that wrong, but basically, (laughs) I mean, I I think you know what I mean. Um, And it's information that's out there. I've just never seen it put in order. And considering the music industry was set up, you know, in like the 1950s to confuse artists, Mm -hmm. if you're teaching something out of order, that's going to be super hard for the student really hard for the educator. Um, so yeah, so it's a really methodical step-by-step process. I think it's like under 140 pages. Um, yeah. And I, you know, it came out in March, 2020. Um, I had very few people read it before it was out. It, It was really just me. There's never been a social media ad or any promo or anything. And it is just spread like wildfire. And I always felt like if it helped one musician, um, then, then I'm good. But to see so many artists posting about it, sharing it with other artists, um, is great. And yeah, I'm I, like I said, it just really warms my heart that it's helping people. That's awesome. So what are some of the top kind of income streams or like money that has been lost by artists that they didn't realize that they could collect? I'm assuming some of these things have to do with royalties. So the number one missing revenue stream I see is music publishing. Mm -hmm. And that is because, as you know, when artists sign up for a performing rights organization, um, they need to create a publishing designee. So, you know, maybe your, um, you know, Brie Noble music for your publishing designee. And understandably, songwriters then think like, oh, I'm good. Like ASCAP's collecting on my publishing for me. Because again, you've created a publishing designee But if your songs are being covered, streamed, sold, any of the above, 
your performing rights organization is only part of your music publishing. So I really love Song Trust because they've democratized music publishing. Mm-hmm. Um, back in the day, you used to have to sign your rights away um, just to have your music publishing collected on. And just to define music publishing really quick, it's just songwriting. You know, like it's not anything to like be terrified of and and run to the hills over. So if you are just signed up for your performing rights organization, ASCAP, BMI in the U.S., and you are not collecting on your music publishing in any other way, you are missing out on money. So I like Song Trust because anyone can sign up for it and you can also get out of it. I think within like three months, they don't take any rights um, ownership or anything. So that's really revolutionized music publishing um, the way that like TuneCore, DistroKid, CD Baby has on the music distribution end. So again, if you're just signed up for your PRO, um, please sign up for Song Trust or some sort of music publishing equivalent so you can get um, your music publishing fully collected on. So would that be, would they be considered a, a publishing administrator? Is that okay? Yeah. Exactly. Just to get the terms correct. Cause I know that, I know that my audience is like, like you said, when they hear publishing, they're like head starts to spin and their brain blows up and, you know, because it does, it is, oh, it is a big ball of wax. And there's a lot of like, you know, names that you don't understand how they're related to other, like people are like, should I have song trust? I have BMI. I'm like, no, that's a different thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, something else I was going to say about that. Um, it'll, yeah, it'll come to me. Sorry. Happy Friday. <laughs> um, and then, so, okay. So what are a couple other of the, the income streams that you find that artists are not collecting on? Um, definitely missing out on a lot of direct to consumer uh, funds, as well as the data that comes along with it. So you know, to me, the A plus version is release music. Uh, well, start before that, actually start with a pre-order or a Patreon, right? Start monetizing your music while you're making it. Um, then when it's out, you know, like push your website to me, that's the A plus version. That's where you're going to collect the most money um, and the most data. Then the next day it's out, I would push Bandcamp because um, that's where you're going to get the second highest profit margin and fan data for your long term use. And then the third day, push Spotify, you know, Mm -hmm. like you don't need to push the streaming platforms and the DSPs. I get how addicting that is. I get how tempting that is. And then you can um, continue to push out, um, you know, the additional DSPs. So start with Spotify. Then the next day, be like, hey, my release is on Apple Music. Then the next week, title or whatever. And that way you're continuing to promote your music without um, like technically repeating yourself. But yeah, I just see too many people. Um, just be like, okay, it's on Spotify instead of like a pre-order, you know, again, I, the website might not be as appealing to people. So if that's torture, you know, like do band camp and then do the DSPs. Cause that's, what's going to be best for artists financially. And like I said, that's how they're going to collect the most data for, the, for their own long-term use. Yeah, no, I really like that because it is true that in my opinion, the, the, uh, streaming platforms really are for mostly for discovery. Like, obviously I consume music there. Uh, but I discovered so many new artists through there. But when your f- thing first comes out, you want to let your super fans know so they can support you. And of course, beforehand, like you said, with the, I'm a big fan of pre-orders, uh, definitely mm-hmm. Patreon. And then when it first comes out, like have a way for them to actually support you at that point, the people that want to support you. And if you have a website, like I love Banzoogle because you don't have to pay commission or to anyone or anything, you get all the money really easy to set up. So you can do that or you can do band camp and then go out to the, let them know about the DSPs. Cause the people that want to buy from you, they also want to connect with you on Spotify, especially if that's where they're already listening to music. Right. Yeah, for sure. And another thing to keep in mind, I mean, I hesitate to say this cause I want artists to do what's true to their release, but, um, you know, there's an artist, uh, that I know that releases an album every year on his birthday. And so he's done a little experimenting where I think two years ago, you know, he just released it on his birthday or whatever. Um, But then the next year he played around with um, dripping out the tracks and then having that lead into the release. And for better or for worse, Spotify's algorithms loved that, you Mm -hmm. know? So if you can drip out your release, that's really going to feed into the playlist and, and that, you know, current ecosystem. 
Yeah, I always recommend people release at least three singles before they release the full release because that's really like breadcrumbs for not just for your fans and people discovering you, but also the algorithm. That's right. Exactly. Totally. Okay, that is super awesome. So let's talk about the um, the get out the vote thing. Um, I was like totally unaware of this, I must admit, because I live in California and I just don't think that you know, I don't know, people here definitely vote, but it's also like, we kind of already know which direction our state is going. (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, But I love that what your focus was the swing states, which is really important. What even gave you the idea to do this? Um, Thanks for asking. So I'm originally from Wisconsin, where the 2016 presidential Mm -hmm. election was decided by 10,000 votes and change, sorry, 22,000 votes and change. It was decided next door in Michigan by 10,000 votes and change. And I'd read that voter turnout was down in Milwaukee, where I'm from. And I was like, 22,000 is our basketball arena. Why don't we put together some sort of compelling concert and tie in voting? Um, since then, Billboard very, very kindly pointed out that um, like way more young people, like 65% of young people attend concerts, but like 30% of young people vote. So we're mm-hmm. trying to bridge that gap and again, um, do it by booking and programming artists um, that fans are actively listening to in those key states. So like, um, so for example, every year my parents go to Irish Fest in Milwaukee and they come back and they're like, oh my gosh, the Red Hot Chili Pipers are the most amazing band ever. (laughs) And then, so I wasn't totally surprised that the Red Hot Chili Pipers were a top streaming act in Wisconsin. And so we booked them and all last summer I had to hear from industry colleagues being like, Oh, you know, there's a typo on your website. I'm like, no, this is really who we booked. And then, you know, it's a small sample size, but my mom would be like, my friends can't believe, you know, red hot chili pipers is playing your event. So, um, it was a really interesting mix. Of course, like I said, we had Billie Eilish and, and, you know, folks that people have heard of nationally, but it was really interesting to dig into the data and metrics and see what people were listening to where. That is really interesting, especially those those smaller areas. Like I said, being from Southern California, I think mine would be really, really boring, right? It would probably be just Taylor Swift and, you know, Billie Eilish and all the normal people. Um, but that is so cool to think that they've got these little pockets of fans, especially if they're doing a lot of live and festivals and things there. Um, what's the structure around this? Is this a nonprofit? Like, are you are you getting paid to do this or is this totally volunteer? Um, great question. Um, so our C-suite is 100% women. Um, we assembled a team of over 250 volunteers that are 92% women, non-binary people of color or LBGTQ+. Um, unfortunately, that means statistically we receive 5% of the funding we would receive if I were a cisgendered white male. Um, so we've never had funding. Um, but if you talk to me next week, that might be changing. Um, mm. I retired as an artist manager in May um, to fully focus on fundraising. Um, We did just receive our nonprofit status and I've been um, taking some pretty high level meetings um, that I think, knock on wood, is gonna come together um, for for funding for I Voted Festival 2022. I'm gonna make it happen hell or high water, but you know, that's what we could do with no budget. So I can't wait to show people what we can do with, I don't know, running a social media ad <laughs> and paying ourselves and, and artists. And, um, but yeah, it was really a massive effort um, between our volunteers and the artists for 2020. That's super exciting. Oh gosh. I love hearing that. And that just bugs me that you said that, you know, it's a lot harder for you to get funding because it seems like it should be easier. Like, you know, the, the government is always, you know, saying, oh, you know, we've got these these systems to help out these people. But when it comes down to it, you know, there really isn't a lot, I think. It's really challenging. I have been disappointed with, you know, our industry. Um, I've had a lot of really, really, really high level colleagues just kind of be like, well, what do you need funding for? And I'm like, mm-hmm. and we're talking the founders of like major festivals people have heard of. Um, So I think the attitude is kind of like, oh, that's cute. Emily's doing voter turnout. But um, I've gotten really blunt and I I think I've um, aligned with some some folks outside of the music industry that really see our vision and want to help us take it to the next level. So hopefully that comes together. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, well, this has all been really great. I loved hearing your story and like the evolution of your career. And I think that that's going to be really interesting to our listeners. Um, Is there any 
any like parting advice that you'd like to give to indie artists who are listening? Um, I laid it all out in the book, but I feel obnoxious saying that. Um, so the book is also in podcast form, which is obviously free. Um, so the how to build a sustainable music career and collect all revenue streams podcast, literally, I just, I booked guests based on each chapter to bring each chapter to life. So we've had folks like Justin Vernon, um, from Bon Iver and Imogen Heap and Cam Franklin from the Suffers. Um, Warp Tour founder, Kevin Lyman, Don Passman. So they literally helped me bring each chapter to life. So if that's a better way for you to consume information, I mean, we have, we literally have an episode called How to Land a Sync Placement. And that one's one of my favorites with my friend, Lauren Ross from Terror Bird. So yeah, so that's free wherever, you know, people listen to podcasts. And then, I mean, I think it's a journey, but if you want to jump around and pick and choose like, oh, I really want to learn more about the sync stuff or publishing or whatever, it's it's all very clearly labeled and step by step for folks. That's awesome. And and I I definitely agree that everyone should listen to all of it. Like I get that you want to learn about certain things, but they all work together. And if you don't know all the pieces, you know, you're gonna be missing something as you're doing that one thing. So I think it's really important that you guys consume all of it. Thank you. Say. And and that reminds me of what I was going to say earlier. Um, you know, when, when you were talking about like how publishing can be complex and things like that, like I just tried to define what things are and explain how people get money from it. It's like, there are obviously whole books, just for example, on music publishing. If you want to go a deep, go into a deep dive and learn the name of every sub publishing revenue stream, fine. But I don't think you have to do that. I just want you to understand that music publishing is your songwriting basically and how to collect on it. And that's really how the book is structured. Like I said, if you want to go do a deep dive, feel free, but most artists don't. And that's really challenging, right? So I just try to lay it out as simple and straightforward as possible and then how it can benefit them. That's great. And let me ask, so I know that publishing and copyright and all that is a little bit different in different countries. Are you covering this based upon like a U.S. perspective? Because I know there's things like neighboring rights and stuff in other countries that we don't necessarily do. Um, I definitely I, I'm American and it comes from my perspective, but I did try to write it from a global perspective. We definitely cover uh, neighboring rights, you know, finding your PRO, you know, that's based in your country. So I tried to speak as um, internationally as I can, but the podcast is also charted on six continents. Um, it has listeners in 130 countries. So I give the listeners credit for speaking English. Like I'm not taking credit, like I'm this worldly person, but I did try to speak about things from a global perspective, just based on, you know, my touring experience and, um, certain sensitivities or areas that I do know about the global music industry. Mm, that's awesome. Okay. So tell them again, the name of the podcast, so they can just go type it right now. Sure. The book and podcast is how to build a sustainable music career and collect all revenue streams. Perfect. And where can people find you on the internet, on social media? I'm at EM Wizzle um, on Twitter, Instagram, and I guess on Facebook as well. Great. Thank you so much, Emily. This has been really, really amazing and enlightening. My pleasure. And thanks for everything that you do for women and and artists. It's, It's really an honor to be on your show. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.